Good morning, folks. Welcome to our Springtime on the Farm Heritage Fundraiser event. I'm Joel Halberfer, the Collections Manager here at the Mennonite Heritage Center. And this morning I'm going to be showing you and doing a little bit of demonstrating of selected antique farm equipment from our collection here. And the focus on this presentation will be mainly on with farm equipment and tools that were used in the springtime or summertime, um, the pieces selected from our collection. Here we have a implement that was used in the springtime. Cultivator and furrow striker was developed and in, invented and patented here locally in Salford Township near the village of Moorwood, which was at that time called Gaiman's. But it's a uh, the cultivator plow, sometimes referred to as cultivator plow, a furrow striker, a furrow coverer, developed by uh, a blacksmith, Jacob M. Landis, who lived in Salford Township, just above the Branch Creek, not far from the village of Gaiman's, as it was then called, now Moorwood. We're also fortunate to have the original patent model that Jacob M. Landis had to submit to the U.S. Patent Office in Washington, D.C. So this model and the actual implement, if I didn't say it already, was from 1886. And this is a beautifully constructed patent model with expert wood uh, craftsmanship. So here's the actual patent model that uh, this copy he kept in for his family. This descended in his family and was given to us back in the 1970s by his great-grandson, perhaps. Also from that same descendant, uh, we have the original patent letters, the patent uh, award that was granted by the U.S. Patent Office, 1886. Um, whereas Jacob M. Landis of Gaiman, Pennsylvania, has presented the commissioners of patents, a petition praying for the grant of letters patent. Well, here are the actual letters patent for this, this implement. And it, it gives you, shows you a, a, a print, a drawing of the actual uh, patent uh, plan, the actual model. And again, it says Jacob M. Landis Agricultural Implement, December, Patented at December 14, 1886. And then there's a second page showing some of the features of the implement. There were some changeable parts, um, these furrow covers and the furrow strikers. The cultivator um, blades were movable, removable and changeable. So it had a multi-use Purpose. Well, here we have another implement that was used in springtime. This was used in field preparation. It's just a different type of, uh, perhaps a little newer type of furrow striker or row marker than what I showed you previously. This came from a local farm. We know little about it. Uh, we don't know who made it, uh, but it has two um, furrow strikers or little shovels uh, that as it gets pulled through the field, it actually, it, it's drawn by, it was drawn by two horses. This is a two horse uh, piece of equipment. And here's where the farmer sat. And in the front here on the sled are iron pieces that actually mark the rows as, as it comes along. Here we have an early fodder cutter that came off of the Moyer homestead in Upper Salford Township. This is perhaps the, one of the oldest, if not the oldest pieces of farm equipment in our collection. Based on the construction techniques here, the hand forged iron work and all the fine carpentry, mortise and tenon work, we think this is from the early 19th century, that is the early 1800s. So it came from the farmstead of one Christian C. Moyer and his son Abraham M. Moyer along Huntsberger Road in Salford Township, Montgomery County, just close to the upper Salford border. Then it remained up in the upper level of the barn till about two years ago when we were invited to come visit that 
that farmstead and pick out some old, old pieces of equipment there on the farm. Um, I found, literally found it half buried under a pile of old straw on the roof of the granary up in the barn. If you can ima imagine that, if you know about granaries and barns, so the roof of the granary, the ceiling of the granary covers the barn, but I mean covers the granary, and then above that it's a whole lot of open space within the, the hay or straw mow where they typically put, in those days, loose straw or loose hay. Well, this piece, when it was no longer useful, when it had outlived its usefulness, was put in storage on this, above the ceiling of the granary, and gradually straw and dirt and chaff piled on top of it, until when we got there in the summer of 2019, it was half buried, mostly buried under old, old loose straw. And I started digging around up in the darkness and realized, got a flashlight on it, and realized this is, this is a pretty old piece of farm equipment. We got it out in the light, which confirmed, in fact, it is a pretty early piece of farm equipment. So if you want to come closer, and it's a fodder cutter. That is for cutting greenish or partially green, not dried corn stalks um, into fodder. I don't have any of that available here in the springtime, but I do have a little bit of old straw left over. We'll see how this works. It's not designed for cutting straw, but we'll see how it works. And it has an interesting clamping device. You can see how that, with a, a foot pedal, spring-loaded, reverse spring-loaded clamping device, you push down with the foot pedal over here, and it has an interesting uh, leverage system on the back. Maybe we'll show that later, Harry. But it's spring-loaded so that when you release the foot pedal, it lifts up so you can keep pushing your fodder in as you cut it. Let's see what happens with this straw. It, again, it's not designed for cutting straw. So you clamp down, you slice, move it ahead a little bit, clamp down again, release the clamp, move it ahead, clamp down. The blade is very sharp. It's very sharp, but it is not designed for cutting straw. But it is, if I keep the blade tight against the metal edge, it is doing it somewhat. So you get the effect. But there you can see the clamping device. And that gives you the effect. And if you can come in a little closer, we can point out some construction details. You see this nice decorative slightly decorative detail this is not uh this wouldn't have been necessary this is just simply fine craftsmanship or a little bit of decoration on this very common what was then common piece of farm equipment you can see the mortise and tenoning this was a strong brace here it's mortise and tenon here and actually here is here as well for the handle that handle arm has to be well constructed because there's a lot of stress on that. So it's mortised and tenoned there. It's mortised and pegged here. And I get I guess there. This is a solid piece of I suppose pine, but this is oak, I believe. The wing nuts, the wing nuts are all hand forged. This is all hand forged. Um, everything about this is entirely handmade. Somebody along the, the way put some leathers and we made some new leathers just to create less uh, friction between the wooden parts. Um, the clamp, I believe, is made out of maple. It's a very, it's a hard wood that's been here a long time. It's been used hard. All the metal, all the metal parts, if you can come around the back here, Harry, so we can show this clamping device, it's really pretty interesting. All the metal is hand forged, which indicates it's, you know, it's older, probably older than 1850, I'm pretty sure of that. The whole construction of it indicates early 1800s. It's braced across the back here. That's why, that's why it's also more just there. There's a brace across the back and goes up to here. And this, all of this is related to the the foot activated uh, foot controlled clamping device where you feed the fodder in all of this chain and this hardware all hand forged it's, it's pretty amazing that 
that it all survived, actually, that, that the whole thing survived. And there's even, somebody added, it's an old piece of hinge hardware. Somebody added, I think, added onto the bottom as, a, again, a spring device to help, so you can only push it down so far to the barn floor. I think that's the purpose of that. And we can show a little bit of the, uh, the cutting arm. This is a heavy duty, again, mortise and tenon here, the heavy duty arm, well built, but this piece, long ago, the arm that holds the lever um, uh, shaft, um, this cracked long ago at some point, and so they did, a, this is an old repair, a strap that was put on here to repair and stabilize that arm that cracked it was long ago. Here you can see again more of the, the detail of the hardware for the uh, clamping device. Here we have another very important and basic piece of farm equipment that was necessary for spring field preparation, that is the plow. In this case, it's a single furrow, wooden beam, walking plow, pulled by, drawn by two horses generally. Two horses, not one, but in this case, two horses. So it's wooden beam as opposed to the later, stronger plows that were developed. In, 20 years after this, roughly, the iron beam plow was much stronger, wouldn't, would last longer, wouldn't break. This particular plow is dated and has the initials of the blacksmith who made it, um, 1861 JB, and I'll say more about that in a minute, who he was, who we think he was. But this plow also came from that same uh, Moyer farm on Huntsberger Road in Salford Township, Montgomery County, same farm as the fodder cutter we had out back at the shed. Um, this came from that same farm, the Abraham M. Moyer farm. Um, we know that, that Abram Moyer was married in about 1860 and took over the farm soon after that. And so the, the dating of the plow of 1861 corresponds with when he would have started out in farming um, as a young man. The plow remained on that farm until the summer of 2019 when we were given the opportunity to go through the barn and the sheds and pick out what we wanted for our collection. And this was one of the pieces we found up in the second story of an old wagon shed, second story that had no stairway access, just a ladder to climb up. I'll point out some other details as, as well as the date and the name. There, a lot of the, the work here, the, the iron work, is, is hand forged. Here's a one wing wing nut that's all hand forged, screw and wing nut. The, uh, the mold board, the plow share itself, and the mold board is, uh, is all hand forged by a blacksmith. And the tongue device, the hitching device, is where we find the date and the initials of the blacksmith who made it. So it's JB1861. And through some research, we discovered that this must be one Jonas Berge of Franconia Township, who in fact was a blacksmith listed in the 1860 census. So we're pretty sure that this JB is one Jonas Berge, Jonas G. Berge, who was a blacksmith in those years, those very years, and had his shop on his father's farm near what is now Erlington. So we're at the farm of Stephen Burke Holder in, uh, just outside of Fleetwood in the Ole Valley. Technically, I think it's called the East Penn Valley. We're north of the Hereford Hills down in the Ole Valley. And Steve is an old order Mennonite produce farmer who likes to work with horses, train horses, and farm with horses. Not all, actually not many of the old order Mennonites farm with horses anymore, but Steve Burke Holder does out of his own interest, heritage interest, but the other thing he does is I think once a year he he plans, he has a class in learning how to work with draft horses. So people come from various places, various uh, living history farms, heritage farms, other people who want to work with, learn to work with draft horses. And so this weekend he's holding a class for several students who are here and this student, whose name I don't know, 
is uh, plowing with a, a two-way walking plow with a two-horse two horse hitch. That's a double tree. The orange hardware you see there is a double tree for a two-horse hitch. This is uh, Lawrence Burkholder, Steve's brother, here. Tell us a little bit about this and how this plow works. Maybe get it close to that. Okay. The idea of it was so you could plow out one side of the field, swing the bottom over to uh, the other huh. side. Interesting. So this is, that's yeah. the first time seeing it actually work. <laughs> turn your team around and head back the same furrow. Would you mind doing that again one time? Just So you kick the, uh, the, the, cat, the latch and you're actually turning it under the, uh, the beam. Under the frame of it. The frame of it. And let's get here on the other side. Uh -huh. Now for your, so next, the, your next pass, will you be going over to the other side of the plow? We will or, now because that plow is going out yeah, around. Uh -huh. So you'll keep so you'll keep this that. Is, this is the shear <laughs> going that way, and when you flip it around, that becomes the the shin. Is that called the fore share? Is that what they call? Or is this the fore share down yeah, here? Yeah, that's the. And this one is, uh, as you can see, it's kind of double. So uh -huh. going one way, you have yep. this as the shear, and this as the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, round. <laughs> Steve is this year, this spring, conducting a class and working with draft horses. He does this once a year, I believe. He has several students here today. Today they're doing a four-horse hitch, pulling a two-way sulky plow. And what that means is, this, you can see now, the sulky plow is essentially reversible. They can turn around at the end of this furrow, furrow and drop the other share just come back the same way. Here we are with uh, Steve Burke Holder and Ian from the Quiet Valley Historical Farm up near Stroudsburg who's in the class today and he's learning how to plow with a, a uh, two-way sulky plow that has a four-horse hitch and what we can see here in the hardware Steve this is a, a double tree if you want to point out the hardware and the evener is the big bar at the back. The big back bar. These here are sink for double trees on either side to even out so they each get the fair share of right. the load. Of, of, the, of the pulling, of, of the traction power. And then these are the traces hitched to single trees. The single trees are the, the each, individual. Each horse has its own single each tree. Each horse has its single tree. There's a German translation. The German word for an evener is like a scale. It's a scale. Uh -huh. a, a balance beam almost. That's right. <laughs> so that's with a four horse hitch like this, you have to have the hardware, the tools to even even out the uh, the traction power that the horses are pulling the machine with. This is uh, Rocky from up in Carbon County, plowing with his own team of horses here in the East Penn Valley on Steve Burkholder's farm. And again, he has the uh, two-way walking plow, sing single furrow plow. And I think the uh, class members are about done plowing for this morning. So Rocky and his team are gonna take a break for lunch and they're 
going to take the horses into the barn to un unhitch, but this is how they drag a plow either through the unplowed field or in this case down the lane. The plow gets turned over on its side and the horses are just simply dragging it back to the barn. Yankee's doodle. <laughs> yeah. So how old is he? Three weeks. Yep. And again, these are Percherons. Yep. springtime work was field and soil preparation to get ready for planting but one of the things uh, they, they planted in, each year was uh, either grain seed and, and grass seed of various kinds and this device is a seeder a broadcast seeder but it's a unique kind of broadcast seeder known as a fiddle bow seeder and I think you can understand why literally like the fiddle bow. It goes back and forth and it has a leather belt. It's almost like an old sewing machine belt that wraps around a, uh, a spool or um, yeah, a spool device that turns the shaft that spins the broadcaster. So this is for seeding various types of grass and grain. Um, I'll get a little closer and show you some, some details of this thing. Interesting handle. Spring on either end of the handle so that when you go back and forth you're not bumping hard uh, with wood against wood. It just makes it a little more uh, continuous or gentle as you're going back and forth as you're walking along in the field. Here's the, the bag, which would have had a, a shoulder strap, which is now gone, and the bag that holds the seed. This is a left-handed, as far as I can, well, no, it's a right-handed model. You use it at your left-hand side. So the seed goes in here, shoulder strap would go over your shoulder, so you hold it, you hold it about here. And then there's various settings on this particular model for different types of seed. And there's a lever here that you would pull back to that that setting and it's marked for um, originally stamped for timothy clover flax wheat or oats and what that does um, you pull it back to that particular setting and there's a stop a, 
a screw uh, here that lets you create a stop for that lever. And what that does, it, it opens the, um, the seed uh, container, the seed feeder to a certain width based on where this stops at, based on which seed you're planting. So there's a like a hopper type device that opens to a certain width to let out the various sizes of seed. Another type of seeder uh, is this device. It's a corn seeder. Uh, corn gets spaced apart typically six to eight inches. Although in earlier days, I understand corn was planted in hills by Native Americans and by the early by 18th century farmers, maybe into the 19th century, corn would be planted in hills, oh, two, two to three feet apart and planted by hand. But this device, a corn planter, again, used as you're walking along, this is perhaps from, this is from the late 1800s, 1880s or 90s, I would guess. Um, the hopper here holds the corn seed and what it does, does two things for you without having to bend over each time when you open it like this it, it forms a point a point at the bottom which lets you jab into the ground again your your field is tilled and ready to plant this field is not ready to plant but you, when your field is tilled the soil's loose this allows you to jab into the ground to a certain depth whatever you think four four inches three to four inches deep I guess three inches deep for corn so it's an estimation you jab in and then you compress once and it releases one seed. There's a mechanism in here that opens the bottom just enough to release one seed or perhaps two. Maybe it releases two. So it releases, then you lift up. And I guess you can cover it over with your foot and then you move along again another six inches. Press, jab in, release, let the seed drop, cover it over and move ahead. <laughs> Here we have a Planet Junior number three garden planter. So this is a seed planter, not for large field work, but for garden planting. Has a uh, hopper where you put various seeds, again, corn, sweet corn or beans, green beans, lima beans, maybe, maybe some other seeds that you would plant for a larger crop in your truck patch or your garden. This particular um, artifact came from a local Mennonite farm. This was just given to us last uh, last fall as a donation, but it came off of the farm of uh, one Rufus Durstein of Tremenson Township near the Hatfield Township line, just kind of uh, south of Elroy. I want to show yet a few photos of local springtime farm scenes that relate to the live footage we've shown just, uh, just previous. Here we see uh, Schwenkfelder Isaac Kriebel planting corn on his farm in Lower Salford about 1890. It's a single row corn planter pulled by one horse. Here's Isaac's wife, Susan Fisher Kriebel, raking hay on their farm about 1890. That's a spring tooth hay rake to make windrows in the field. Susan appears to be very confident in her work. Here's Susan Kriebel Landis and her daughter Lizzie Landis doing chores on their farm in Worcester Township about 1905. It looks like they've just fed the barn cats. John B. Cuffle takes a break from plowing with his little son Harvey on the horseback about 1906. Notice the two dogs in the scene, including one up on the horse. Wheat binding, once a common summertime farm scene, shown here on the farm of Jacob A. Culp in Harleysville about 1910. Here's Warren Delp disking in Harleysville with a clumsy looking early tractor about uh, 1920. Is it steam powered? 
farm boy, Arthur Hackman of Hatfield Township, cultivating corn under the observation of superintendent of agriculture at the new Hatfield Consolidated School in June of 1924. Arthur was a student there. The Abram Frederick family of Hilltown Township, Bucks County, hauling in hay from their fields about 1925. Milton, uh, Milton Landis and relatives checking the strawberries on his farm in Worcester Township about 1925. This must have been a Sunday afternoon. So they're not actually picking, they're just checking and sampling. Farmer preacher Elias Landis and his sons of Lower Salford Township, close to the Salford Mennonite Meeting House, making hay on their farm about 1939. Levi R. Berge planting corn with horses on his farm near Doylestown about 1945. And this land, the land around this, this farm is now completely developed with, with housing and small factories, but mostly housing. Most area farmers had transitioned to tractors by now. Floyd Land is here cultivating corn in Franconia Township on his farm in 1952. James Gunst uh, seeding some kind of grain in upper, South, in upper Providence Township, Montgomery County, about 1954. And by the time of this photo, farming was a fading lifestyle around Harleysville. Here's John Culp dis disking on his father, Francis Culp's farm in Lower Salford, about 1976. This landscape has completely changed in the last 30 years. It's where Walmart and the giant supermarket now sit. Elderly uh, Sally and Cyrus Landis gardening on their farm near Vernfield in Franconia Township about 1977. They would have a few more years on their farm until it changed hands. And here we see yet at a recent apple butter frolic, Berks County Mennonite farmer Steve Burkholder with myself, Joel Haldifer, and at the frolic in 2018. Steve has demonstrated uh, harnessing and hitching as well as plowing with horses at the Frolic for several years. Thanks to Steve for allowing us to film him and his brother Lawrence, as well as their students working with draft horses on their farm for this program. <laughs> 